This means we gotta, if we really wanna get out of debt, if we really wanna manage our money, we wanna stay out of debt, you gotta nip it in the budget, right? You gotta nip it in the budget. And you gotta tell your money where to go. Because if you don't tell your money where to go, it's just gonna tell you goodbye. Or it's just gonna fly off without telling you anything. So you gotta know where it's going. So I'm gonna give you a few principles to help you do this. Now, first principle, you work that debt snowball. But as you work the debt snowball, I encourage you to also create an uh uh-oh fund. And the uh uh-oh fund is also known as an emergency fund. Begin with trying to build up about $1,000 for the rainy day, for the problems that come, because we all know life brings problems to us. So do your best to build up about $1,000 in a saved fund, and this is for just emergencies. Now, eventually you wanna build that to about three to six months of your income to protect you against the rainy day, because we know that rainy days happen. This doesn't mean we don't trust in God. This just means we're not careless, and we're partnering with God to do our part to not block the blessing and allow God to do his part to take care of us and provide for us as he would. Proverbs 22, three tells us that a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The prudent person says, someday something bad's gonna happen, I'm gonna be ready when it comes. But the simpleton goes blindly on and then suffers the consequences. You know, you know that bad things are gonna happen. You know that things are gonna break down. Water heaters will stop heating. That was a cold reality one day in the Fitz home years ago. Van transmissions stopped transmitting. That was a long drive home for the Fitz family years ago. Employers may stop employing. Bones break, teeth get knocked out. Stitches need to be, you know, put in. I don't know, put in stitches. You need stitches, right? Bad things happen. Medical problems happen. Problems come your way. You gotta be ready for them before they do. That way they don't take you by surprise. And this emergency fund is for the emergencies only. And then as you do that, as you work the debt snowball, you build up your emergency fund, then save for upcoming purchases. Look down the road and know what's coming because we all know there are things on the horizon that are going to be expenses for us. The kids are gonna need braces. They're gonna need a college education. The car that we drive eventually is gonna be undrivable and we're gonna need to replace it. We're gonna need to put on a new roof. We're gonna need to replace certain things in the house and you build up the savings for those things that are coming down the road. And if you wanna take that vacation down the way, you save up for those things that you want to do, not just the things you have to do. You save up for them so that you don't go into debt to do those things. And just like the video says, if you don't have the money for it, you don't do it. So you save up for it to keep you out of debt. Proverbs 21.5 says that good planning and hard work lead to prosperity. Good planning, we plan ahead for it. But hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. Now there is no shortcut to saving. There's no get rich quick scheme that actually works. In fact, most people who get rich quick, it flies away pretty quick. The average person who wins the lotto goes bankrupt within just a few years. So I encourage you, plan and work hard and be diligent along the process. So you build the uh uh-oh fund, you save for upcoming purchases, and then you work to build wealth. And that doesn't mean that you build wealth just for yourself. Listen, it's not evil, it's not a sin to have money. What you do with that money can be sinful or it can be holy. You can bless others or you can rob others. So I encourage you to build your wealth, to invest in your future, to invest in your family, to invest in God's kingdom work. And one way to do that is to take advantage of your work, if you're still working, to take advantage of the retirement plan at your work if they offer a matching system. If they're giving you any kind of match, that's free money. So take advantage of that and use that to help build wealth for down the road. But whatever you invest in, whatever money you make, also invest it in God's kingdom purposes. You know, there's so many options for investing. I'm gonna keep us out of the weeds today, and I'm gonna direct you instead to some people who can help you figure that out. Darren Key in his book, The Quest, which we've made available to you, offers some great suggestions in there. Christian Financial Resources, who we partner with, can help you with your investing. There's some other local Christian business financial advisors who we'd love to connect you to who can help steer you in that if you have any questions. But over all of that, the principle that guides all of our investing is this, that we wanna take advantage of compound interest, that we wanna utilize compound interest. Now, when God created the world, he created the world with some very specific laws in place that govern how the physical universe works. 
Things like the law of gravity and the law of motion. Things like the law of thermodynamics. Well, one of those laws is the law of compounding interest. And, and undergirding all the other ideas is mathematics. Like math plays into all of it. So, contrary to popular opinion, math did not originate in hell, but it actually came from God. <laughs> all right? So your high school math teacher was actually trying to do you a favor. That was actually holy work that they were doing. So go easy on them, right? Because math is from God. And I just want to give us just, I'm going to get into the numbers again, so stick with me if you're not a number person. You remember earlier, that $8,000 that we talked about that you might be in debt? It took 40 years and $64,000 to pay off. What if we were able to reverse that, and instead of owing $8,000, we were able to save $8,000, and then we invested it, let's just say at a very conservative 6%. Now, many accounts do way better than that over their lifetime. But if you just make 6% on 8,000, and let's say you park it in that investment and you leave it for 40 years, and you'll never add to it, you'll actually make over $80,000. So the true financial cost of your debt is 64 in the hole or 80 grand in your pocket. And that's pretty significant. And if you had an extra 80 grand in your pocket that you could bless others with, and that were to give you peace instead of the stress of debt, you could really honor God with that, couldn't you? You know, all these mathematical principles, I'm gonna let you know the theology behind it. I think one of the reasons God talks a lot about money and there's math throughout scripture is because God knows that there's a great metaphor there for the bigger issues in life. That saving, investing, getting out of debt, spending is way bigger than our pocketbooks, it's way bigger than our budgets and our bank accounts. That if we invest our lives into the things that matter most, into God's kingdom, these principles of financial investment play out in kingdom investment. That we spend our lives to help other people get to know Jesus. We spend our lives for the kingdom cause. We invest our energy in the kingdom cause. That we do what we can to help save other people from a hellish finality to their life. You know, these, this principle of compounding interest and, and multiplication actually factors into the Great Commission. Jesus told us, he said, go everywhere and tell everyone about me, teaching them to obey me, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. And, and in that, he said, go to all people in all places and make disciples. He didn't just say make converts, but make disciples. Now, if you were to just simply make converts, let's say you led one person to Jesus every day for the rest of your life. Let's say you got 33 years left. For some of you, hopefully you got a whole lot more than that. For some of you, that's a stretch, all right? But let's just say you got 33. You lead one person to Jesus every day. That's 365 people you lead to Christ every year. That's impressive. You do that, you're one of my heroes, all right? Like, that's awesome. After 33 years, you will have led 12,000 people to Jesus, and that's to be applauded, right? That'd be pretty awesome. But that's not Jesus' economy. That's not Jesus' kingdom principle. In fact, Jesus says... To reach everyone, focus on the one. He says, tell everybody about me, but focus on your one and make disciples. And disciple making is a longer term process. Disciple making means we get into somebody's life. So what if instead we simply invested our life into one person every year to help them find Jesus and then follow Jesus and then they began doing the same thing of investing their life in one person every year to help them find Jesus and then follow Jesus. Well, this starts pretty slow. Year one, there's two of you. Year two, well, you are now each have somebody else, and there's four of you. And you get five years down the road, you got 32, that person leads somebody to Jesus every day, has got 1,800. You get to year 10, a decade in, you've got 1,000 people, that's pretty cool, but the person who's leading somebody to Jesus every day has 3,600. But notice what happens in three decades, in 33 years, lead someone to Jesus every day, you got 12,000. You invest your life in one person every year, teach them to do the same, and they teach others to do the same. In 33 years, you've reached eight and a half billion people. You've evangelized the world. And that starts with one person. We got a lot more than one person in this room. We got a lot more than one person online. Friends, what if... We all follow Jesus' model. Jesus took 12 guys and he dumped life deeply into him. He taught the multitudes, but he invested his life into 12. And he taught them to do the same. 
to reproduce themselves. And we know one of them, one of them didn't follow suit. So this number's gonna break at some point, right? Because some of those people aren't gonna follow. But what if everyone in here were to begin doing that? What if in the coming year, each one of us were to take one person And we were to go just hard after that one person, begging God for their salvation every day, praying on their behalf, doing whatever we can to get into their world, to love them towards Christ, to lead them to know our Savior. And then we teach them to do the same thing. What if to reach everyone, each one of us just began with one? I think that's the direction God is moving us. And if we were to do that, what might happen in just a few years. This is not outlandish, this is God's plan. Now friends, of all the investments we can make, of all the investing that matters, Jesus tells us to invest our lives in the things that matter most. In Matthew 6, he says, don't store up your treasures here on earth where moss eat them and rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. No, 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 store your treasures in heaven where you don't have to worry about moth and rust and thieves. Instead, invest in what matters most. He goes on and he says, Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Now notice what he does not say. He doesn't say that where your desire is, where your heart is, there your treasure will follow. He says that whatever you invest in, your heart follows your investment. Your heart follows your treasure. So choose your treasure wisely. Listen, many of you, you might not care about a particular company, but you invest in that company, suddenly you are really concerned about whether it succeeds or fails. You might not... give a rip about a house down the street, but you buy that house, suddenly you're really concerned about the upkeep of that house. You might not care about a particular car, but you buy that car, you really want that car to perform well. You're concerned when it gets a scratch. You're concerned with how well it drives. Similarly, you might not care about a particular ministry or a mission or somebody else's discipleship, but you invest your time, your sweat, your energy, your finances into that ministry, into that mission, into that person what you find is that you become very acutely aware and concerned for their well-being and their spiritual success. So Jesus tells us to invest our lives in the things that matter most in other people. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't have homes or cars or other investments. It means those things shouldn't own us or dominate us. And those things we should use to help people. Those things we should use to further the kingdom. And we make the most of those investments. You know, we've talked a lot about debt. We've talked a lot about financial debt today. But I gotta tell you, there's a debt far worse than financial debt. And that's the sin debt we each owe. Jesus said, he says, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins, by the way, that includes us. There's no exception to the everyone. That includes you, that includes me. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. We are in bondage to sin. And the bad news is, you can't earn your way out of this. You can't buy your way out of this. You can't do enough good deeds, you can't spend enough in the church offering plate for that. There is no debt snowball for your sin debt. And that seems like really bad news. When the Apostle Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, he said this, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature wasn't yet cut away. You know, that's the cost of our sin debt is death. That's the penalty demanded for our sin rebellion against a holy God. But then God made us alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. What great news is that, church? He canceled the sin debt that we deserve and he took it away by nailing it to the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, your sin debt was nailed there with him. Forgiven, freed, redeemed, you're restored, no debt any longer if, if, if you trust him as your savior and you allow him to be king over your life. But that's the only way you get out of that debt. Now, you can pay off every debt you have financially in this world. You can make millions of dollars. And at the end of your days, you can have millions of dollars to your name. But you don't take care of this debt, it doesn't matter. There are a lot of rich people who are getting up in hell, not because they're rich, but because they haven't taken care of their spiritual debt. And you can't buy your way out of that one. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, one of the last things he said was, it's finished. He said, it is finished. And this comes from the Greek word to telestai. And I love this because it's a financial term. It's a term that was used in the market. 
that when the transaction would be done, they would say, to tell us die. The deal's done, the debt is paid, it's over, it's finished, I've paid it in full, there's nothing more to pay here. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. To tell us die, it's finished, it's paid in full. Now I'm gonna date myself a little bit. Y'all remember the movie Braveheart? Some of you weren't even born when it came out, it was back in the 90s, you need to go watch it, skip a couple of the bad scenes, but great movie, great story, I loved it. You remember William Wallace leading Scotland to freedom against England. And then Wallace is captured and he's tortured and they're trying to get him to pledge his allegiance to the king and to beg for mercy from the king. And so they torture him and it's gory. I'm gonna go into details because you're gonna eat lunch soon and it's gross. But they've got him right. Things are like spilling out. It's gross. It's nasty. He's there on this thing. And they've been just torturing him. And they're saying, you know, you pledge your allegiance. Just beg for mercy and it'll end. And Wallace is there and it makes for a great movie. It makes for this great scene. Wallace with his guts spilling. Sorry, it's just gross, but it's true. Like it's what happened. And he's laying there and he musters everything he's got for one final statement, musters his final breath, and they think he's going to beg for mercy. And in a moment of defiance, he cries out. And you remember, you've seen the movie, right? What does he cry out? Say with me, freedom, right? Like, and then he's, he's gone, right? But it's a defiance against the evil of the crown. Listen, what I love about that is I, I geek out on history, but what I love about that is it's an imperfect picture of our king on the cross for us, of our savior paying our sin debt. Then in this moment when he cries out, it's finished. It wasn't a whisper. It wasn't a whimper. It wasn't a cry of defeat. Satan thought he'd won by killing the Savior. Jesus knew there was resurrection was coming around the corner. Friend, this was a cry of victory. This is the battle cry of the redeemed. That Jesus on the cross cries out with everything he's got in his final breath, to tell us die! To tell us die! It's finished. You're dead. debt matters. So you got to get that one right, friend. If you have never surrendered to the king, if you have never claimed his tetelestai freedom over your life, then today is your day. And there's nothing more that we love to talk about around here with the new person than that right there. So if you have not taken care of your sin debt, you meet us after this service right out there in the lobby at the next steps counter. You find me, I'll be standing in the lobby. You come up, you let me know it's your day to talk through that because you got to take care of that debt. It all starts there. But if you have taken care of that, I want you to remember that Jesus didn't just die to save you from hell at the end of your life. He died to save you every day from now throughout eternity. That he wants to save you from addiction. He wants to save you from financial debt. He wants to save you from anxiety and depression and from hopelessness and from broken relationships and from pride and greed and lust and whatever else has got you in bondage. He died so you'd be free from that bondage. The tetelestai power of God should be alive in you. And so church, I hope that if you don't yet know that, if you're joining us online and you don't yet know that, that today is your day. And I pray that if you do surrender to Jesus, if you've done that, that his power is displayed every day in your life.